Good evening. It's an honour and a pleasure to be speaking here this evening. And as Alistair said earlier on, uh, we are concluding our series in the parables of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. And this evening we're going to be looking at the parable of the rich fool, as it is known. This is Luke chapter 12. So we'll see here someone who lives a life of greed rather than a life for God. And also we will have communion later on and we'll think on Christ's death in order to save us. And this parable, I think, serves as a reminder of what God has saved us from. When I was growing up, I can remember when the Gold of the Pharaohs exhibition came to Edinburgh. I don't know if any of you can remember that. Um, any guesses on which year it might have been? It was 1988. There was no prizes for that, by the way. It was 1988. I went there with my school class and I remember seeing all these beautiful gold artifacts that were on show from Egypt. Um, the highlight was the gold funeral mask of this pharaoh, um, Sisinese the I, which some of you might remember. Uh, the mask, not the pharaoh. Uh, we're not that old. Um, so this was a large golden mask in the shape of his face. And the pharaohs were normally buried with lots of goods, drink, uh, food, occasionally even a chariot complete with horses. All this so that he would have a comfortable afterlife. And I always wondered what happened to those that weren't so rich. Now all these things are in a museum or they've been looted. They were not what was the original owner had planned for them. And this evening we'll look at another rich man who had plans for his possessions, a plan that also did not work out someone who wanted to hold his items to make money, but as we'll see, God had other plans. So today, together, we will look at three things from this passage. We'll look at a fool's fight, which is from verse 13 to 15, a fool's fight. Then we'll have a look at a fool's mind in verses 16 to 19. And then lastly, in verses 20 and 21, we will see the fool's future, a fool's fight, a fool's mind and the fool's future. So what is a fool? What do you think of when you hear that word? Well, according to the dictionary, it's a person who behaves in a silly way without thinking. Or, in the old times, it was someone who worked in the court of a king or a queen to entertain them by telling jokes. But what does God mean here in this passage by fool? The Bible has much to say on the subject Proverbs alone mentions the fool over 30 times. A fool can be someone who is ignorant or does not do what is morally right or has an inflated opinion of themselves whilst ignoring God. According to Proverbs 12, verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And I think that is what we will see in this parable. So a fool's fight in verses 13 to 15. So let's set the scene. Jesus has been speaking to a massive crowd in the thousands, according to verse 1. There's so many people that they're trampling and standing over each other. Jesus has been teaching on hypocrisy, attacking the religious leaders of the time. He's spoken about future judgment and also about the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's this section that also contains the loved verse that we are so important to God that even the hairs on our head are numbered. So this huge crowd is pressing in. People are standing on each other. Not many are able to get close to Jesus. But this man manages to get close. Jesus pauses for a moment. The man sees his opportunity. And he asks Jesus something. What does he say? What does he ask the Son of God, the miracle worker? Look at verse 13. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Basically, tell my brother to give me what I'm due. Of all the things to ask the Son of God, it seems as if he's going to ask Jesus a question. He starts, teacher, but it's not. It's a demand. He doesn't ask Jesus to weigh up his claim to see if it's right or not. He just demands. This is someone who's using Jesus to get what they want. This is something completely unrelated 
to what Jesus has just been talking on, these eternal matters. And this man is focused solely on his own immediate needs. It's also a cold, loveless demand. What do I mean by that? Well, it would seem this man has just lost his father and is squabbling with his brother over dividing up the estate. This man, it would seem, is fighting over money. And his brother is likely there because he says, tell his brother, he asks Jesus. What a foolish fight. If this man is successful in getting what he thinks he is due, then he loses his brother. It's money over family. And unfortunately, I'm sure we can all think of families who have been torn apart over money and your inheritance squabbles. So what does Jesus do? Well, he doesn't get drawn into the argument. Look at verse 14. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? The rabbis would often be called, called to settle disputes, but Jesus refuses to intervene, not because he is unqualified, but because he is not called to do so. His mission is to seek and save the lost, as Jesus states later on in Luke's gospel. He is not here to resolve disputes. And it's interesting that the word arbiter in Greek literally means divider. This is the likely outcome of this situation, a family divided. The brothers would have probably not spoken after this point again. So this was truly a fool's fight. And as a result of this interruption, Jesus then turns back to the crowd, as we see in verse 15. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. The New King James Version has, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Greed here is the excessive desire to have more, especially wealth or possessions, to have more. Last century, the American oil magnate John D. Rockefeller was worth approximately $400 billion in today's terms, $400 billion. And he was once asked, how much money is enough money? And his answer, just a little bit more. It's never been satisfied. That's why Jesus warns us of this. Beware of greed. It's so easy to be greedy with our money, with our things, with our time, wanting to keep them just for us and wanting more. Most likely what we see others having, it affects both the rich and the poor. It is constantly wanting more and more, but never being satisfied. And greed is also a barrier to our relationship with Jesus. As Christians, we know that we can only ever be satisfied by a new life in Christ, not by the things that we own. And only by being generous by what, with what God has given us can we overcome greed. So Jesus continues in verse 15, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things we possess. This completely flies in the face of what most people feel today. Life is about acquiring things. You are what you have. The life we see in the films, in TV shows, on Instagram, in Facebook. It's the car, the house, the holiday. That's how many people value themselves and unfortunately value those around them. Where do they work? How many rooms do they have? Where do they go on holiday? Where do they lie in relation to us? Are they doing better? How can I have that? Do we fall into this trap? It's easy to do. Does what they have or don't have make us value people more or less? Or does it cause tension due to jealousy? For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. We are more than what we have, certainly to God. So Jesus, he uses this foolish fight to then teach the crowd using the parable. And we'll see in verses 16 to 19, a fool's mind. So remember the definition of a fool from earlier on. Someone who has an inflated opinion of themselves whilst ignoring God. 
And according to Proverbs, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Keep this in mind as we look at this parable. If we notice in verse 16 that the man, most likely a farmer, is rich already. Also, he has made his fortune honestly. There's no mention of dishonesty or thievery here. But we are not talking about the average farmer at the time who would probably have made just about enough to feed himself and his family from the land that he had. This is a man who is very rich in comparison. He had barns. He would have been well known and influential in his community. And where did his riches come from? Well, the passage tells us this in verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man. This was a gift from God. Without the sun, the rain, and the soil, nothing would have grown. And then we see in verse 17 that he has a problem. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So this is a huge harvest, bigger than any before, as his barns were not big enough. God had blessed him with a bumper crop. So what did he do? Then he says, this is what I'll do. I'll give all this extra to the poor. No. I'll I'll send it over to my friends. No. Not this guy. The thing that would have been done at the time in this culture would have been to go to the elders of the village or the city and discuss the problem with them. They would have been found at the city gates. But not the rich fool. What does the rich fool do? Well, let's look at his words in in verse 17. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. So he has to think about his problem. And then look at all the number of times he talks about himself. I, me, mine. Everything is his. The problem here is not that he is rich, but that he has no thought for God, no thought of thankfulness for this blessing, and no thought for others. So I'll say that again just for clarity. The problem here is not that he is rich, but that he has no thought for God, no thought of thankfulness, and no thought of others. He's got too big for his own barns. And we find in verse We find in Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And that is exactly what we find here in the mind of this fool, the complete absence of God. He gives no thought to God's guidance or to anyone else's for that matter. He must be the wisest person he knows. So why bother asking anyone else? We must also be careful not to fall into the same trap. Do we ask God's guidance for the decisions that we make in our lives, for the lives of our family, in the life of our church gathering? Do we pray and ask what God's will is? So here in this section, the rich fool has mistaken stewardship with ownership. The problem is not about planning for the future. This is something we should do as good stewards. We should prepare for the future and take care of what God has given us. The problem here is that the rich fool does not seek God's guidance on how to use this harvest. Don't fall into the same trap. Be a good steward. Good steward of what you have. uh, But realize that everything we have is a gift from God. We don't really own it. Don't mistake stewardship with ownership. So we see in verse 17, his first thought is not about who to share his harvest with or even what to do with the surplus. He already knows what he's going to do with it. He's going to store it, keep it for himself. The question he has and the problem is how to store it. So as well, there's no mention of God and there's no consideration of family or friends. Perhaps he's alone with no family, but a rich man with no friends. He also doesn't think of the neighboring farmers either who may have benefited for the surplus grain or for the workers in his field. He's already rich and probably doesn't need the extra, but decides to keep it all for himself. So what's he going to do with this bumper crop? He says, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. I'll stop working and use my time to help others. No, 
I'll serve God. No, not this guy. What will he do with it? He will use it to have an easy life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Basically a party attitude. See, he, here he is being greedy with his time. It's all about enjoyment, all about himself. No thought for others. It's me, me, me. Can you cast your mind back two years to images of shopping trolleys packed with toilet rolls and cans of beans? COVID caused some to stop up, stock up to help elderly relatives. Some were panic buying for themselves and yet others were stocking up just to make money. The Guardian reported back in 2020 that one UK seller had made a thousand pounds from selling toilet roll at 50 pounds, made a thousand pounds. So during lockdown, some people were hoarding items and selling them for hugely inflated prices just to make money. If you control the stock, you can control the price. And we see the same thinking and actions in the rich fool that we have just read. He will sell the grain a little at a time to keep prices high, and he will get a good price selling it for many years, or so he thinks. Today, he would be credited as being a good businessman making enough money so that he never has to work again. An impossible dream for those, uh, the majority of the people back then, and still rare even now. But he has made a plan that does not include God. If you don't put God first, it will lead to a plan that you can't deliver on. And this is what we see here in the life of this rich fool. A future plan that the rich fool can't deliver because he has no future. And this leads us on to verses 20 and 21, which show us the fool's future. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The next words are from God. These are very sobering words. The rich fool's life will end that very night and he will stand before God. And his great plan for the future, he had overlooked two things. He was mortal and he was accountable. He was mortal and tonight his life is over. There are no second chances. He will stand before God utterly unprepared. And he is accountable. It says, God says, your life will be demanded. This conveys the idea of a life as a loan of accounts being settled. Our life is a gift from God and one day you must show how you have spent it. Here, Jesus describes a tragedy. The rich fool has spent his life accumulating things and God asks the questions, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The rich fool had been building a little kingdom for himself but having no part in the only kingdom that really matters, God's kingdom. And we see in verse 21, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. As a Christian, are you kingdom focused? Are you using the gifts that God has given you as a steward to further God's kingdom, to spread the love and the good news of God's forgiven love? Are you using your time and money? We do these things, though, to show God's love to this world not to earn God's favour. If this wasn't a parable, I would wonder what happened to the things the rich fool had gathered in his lifetime. Was there someone there to inherit this richness, uh, this riches, or would there be a dispute over it, as we had in the start of the passage with our, our fight over money? Today, the rich fool would have been seen as a success. Work hard, Save well, don't think of others. But thankfully, how different with God. Jesus is the absolute opposite of this, of what the world would describe as a success story. He gave up everything, the position of power and honour to live a life of poverty and ultimately die at the hands of those he had created. He consistently shunned power or attempts to put him in power. He avoided fame and often told those he had healed not to tell anyone who had done it. 
And we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus gave up everything and lived a perfect life with one plan in mind. God's plan to do his father's will. The plan that God the Father always had in place before the world was made. That Jesus would die in your place and take the punishment due for all your sins. The plan would mean that all of our sins would be punished. The payment met, the account settled. But not on us, on Jesus Christ. Through this we have become rich towards God because of what Christ had done. Not because of anything that we have performed. And this is what the rich fool lacked. He trusted in himself and what he had hoarded. He had no thought of the next life and the judgment to come. But we need to realise that even if the rich fool had given away everything that he had, he could not have earned or bought his way into God's kingdom. The only way is through God's forgiveness for all the wrong that we have done in our life, asking him to forgive us and trusting that Jesus has paid the price. That's how much God loves you. He has done everything. There is nothing that you can do. Only believe and accept this free gift. And as I go, draw to a close, I wonder what happened to the man who made the demand of Jesus at the start of this passage. After Jesus had finished speaking, did he slink off and continue his foolish fight? Or did he fix the relationship with his brother? Today you have an opportunity that the rich fool never had. Another evening. An evening to make a decision. You have the opportunity to fix a broken relationship with God or to continue in a foolish fight with the God that loves you and sent his son to die for you. Which will you choose? Ultimately, we need to stand before him one day and give an account of ourselves. We can either do that on our own like the rich fool and face God's judgment or we can do it through Christ, who will stand before God and plead our case for us. This evening, we will end with an empty tomb. Jesus is not there. He is risen. There is new life. There is hope. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. You may not get another. If you have not already, please accept this new life that Jesus is offering. The only life that truly satisfies. And may God bless you. Father, thank you for Jesus that he rose from the dead so that we can have life. Thank you for your word, the Bible, where we can learn about your plan for us and where we can read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Thank you for this plan and for sending Jesus.